Okay, we're here in front of Lockheed Martin's ISR modified uh, Grumman Gulfstream G350, is that no, correct? It's just a G3. G G3? Model. Okay. Tom, you're the pilot here with Lockheed Martin. Can you uh, tell us, uh, start with a little bit of your aviation background, please? Well, I started out fixing airplanes, uh, which has helped in engineering flight tests with an electronic uh, engineering uh, background. Yep. And then uh, getting into aviation, because that's where my true love was, and it's kind of worked into doing flight tests for Lockheed Martin. Okay. Uh, in the last 15 years, I've been with them. And mostly it's engineering flight tests that uh, we do. This has changed the whole nature of the job. We get yeah. to go places to air shows and stuff. Yep. The flight test profiles are very benign. Okay. We go out somewhere and uh, fly circles okay. as a mission. Uh, basically, as this thing does what it does. Okay. So this, so basically, you've just got to fly a real line and length exact. Mm -hmm. Is it like an exact geospatial reference that you can no. fly down, or is it? No, it can be. We're capable of that, but yeah. typically it's not. Okay. Uh, it's just typically uh, covering an area. Yep. And if somebody wants a better look at something, they may move a line over. Okay. Which is easy to do. Yep. Yep. And just change it on the on the mm -hmm. um, the on the systems. box. Yeah. Yep. We have some automation on this. It's a okay. 1984 airplane, so it's not the state of the art stuff, but it yep. works. Okay. So now there's a lot of protrusions hanging off this vehicle. How, how does that modify its handling capabilities? What's it like to fly compared to a normal G3? It handles just like a normal G3, except we have to bias our fuel consumption uh, by about 18%. Okay, and, oh, uh, hold one sec. So it does burn more fuel, of course. Oh yes, yeah. anytime you up the, the external shapes, you, you burn more gas to pull it through the air. Yep. And although even that flare ball, spherical shapes are very uh, aerodynamically dirty. Yeah. We put the strake back there to mitigate those drag effects, but it's, it still has an effect. Okay. I, I told somebody it costs us about a thousand dollars maybe to drag this across the Pacific <laughs> and extra fuel, <laughs> and she, and which so isn't a big. She's got the range still to do that. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, standard G3, they advertise 3,750 nautical mile range. Okay. I start getting under uncomfortable at anything over about 2,800. So. <laughs> yeah. So it was a bit of island hopping. How many yes. stops did you take to get here? Uh, we hit Honolulu, Majuro, okay. uh, Guadalcanal, and yep. then here. Okay. So Cool. And uh, so you've got lots of flying that you're doing while you're down here, taking lots of people out for demos, showing them the systems? Uh, yes. Okay. He shows them the systems. We, we just arranged for a, a bit of airspace from yep. the uh, air traffic control system here. Okay. Cool. Yeah, which we've done. Okay. Any particular? No, you've covered everything. Okay. Tom, thank you very much. Great to have you on the show. Great. Cool. We'll, we'll let you go and uh, get, on, get on with prepping the aircraft for the flight. Okay. <laughs> Matt, you're one of the uh, uh, engineers looking after all the technology on board this bird. Um, how long have you been uh, in the avionics and engineering technology world? Well, I've been an engineer for Lockheed for 10, 11 years. Uh, I've been associated with, with the AML here for the last year, uh, kind of more or less full time, and then a little bit before that, okay. off and on helping out with different systems. Cool. So, so what's involved in uh, getting all this to work on board a Gulfstream? Uh, well, kind of de developed a software architecture where we can test a lot of the stuff in the lab before we actually bring it out to the aircraft so we can have a, a pretty much duplicate environment to test all that stuff, run it through the paces. Uh, all of our software, at least everywhere we can, we run on virtual machines, which allows us to... Uh, to again do that in the lab yeah. and then when we move it out here the environment can be identical okay so that makes it a lot easier for yeah. us to uh, work out some of the kinks and then uh, we get a little time on the aircraft fly it around and uh, see if anything breaks fix it up so. <laughs> okay and uh, approximately how much time uh, like how many man hours are required to um, maintain this aircraft after it's been flying from a software perspective? Yeah, from the systems. Is, do they add anything to, you know, you've got standard electro, uh, like the standard airframe and um, propulsion maintenance, but does how much extra does all this gear hanging off it add to um, keeping a prim and ship shape? Uh, it definitely adds some additional work, uh, just. Oop. Yeah, as we add uh, the extra hardware, there's always little things that, uh, you know, a cable will get pulled out or yeah. something will happen. So there's there's debugging to figure out what the problem is, and uh, yeah. it definitely adds some time. I don't think it's all that uh, extra, really. Okay. It, uh, it adds a lot of... Uh, Unpredictability, I guess. You know what, what what's going to happen now. Yeah. But overall, we we have a pretty good luck with things. So. Okay, cool. Well, that's good. 
Um, what kind of, like, are you allowed to say what kind of platforms the systems are based on? Uh, what operating systems, things like that? We, yeah, we run uh, Windows, I think Solaris, Linux. So we have just about everything on there. Using the virtual machines yep. is very easy depending on whatever software we're bringing on board. Yep. Um, and in that architecture, we can we can bring things in, plug it in really quick, integrate it really quick, pull things out if we don't need it, um, yep. really customize the experience for okay. it. Cool. Does that lead into some sort of uh, redundancy or contingency, like if one platform fails, another different, differently architectured platform can take over for that platform if it fails? I know Airbus sort of use that philosophy a bit. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we use it as a an airborne lab um, for experimentation, so we'll have redundant sensor types, you know, we'll try one sensor and then we may have another that does the same thing, but uh, that way we can experiment with different things and give the configuration that, that works for what we're trying to do. Okay. Are you ever likely to scale this stuff up and put it in bigger aircraft, you know, bigger equipment, bigger aircraft? Uh, that's probably not my call, but I think that that is definitely, you know, John okay. can speak to that yep. a little better. Yeah, right? absolutely. Um, the architecture works very well in the G3, but it would also work just as well on a larger a G550 or a Bombardier Global yep. Express. It may be in a roll-on, roll-off in a cargo aircraft. The architecture is flexible because it's so modern, like Matt yep. said. It would work in, in virtually any flying platform. Okay. Obviously, when you get down to a real small one, let's say a King Air, yep. you're going you're gonna to change your payload significantly. But when you talk about much of the systems we see here around us, it yep. would mount in almost any one of those. Okay, excellent. Okay, uh, thanks Matt, we appreciate Absolutely. having you on. Okay. Thank you. Cool, cheers. Okay, John, you're uh, the uh, project manager communications area. I work business development, or you call it business development marketing for airborne reconnaissance systems. Yep. Uh, among them is the G3 behind you. Yep, okay. So what can you tell us about this G3 project? What's its purpose, where did it come from, and what's it's doing? Um, its purpose is, as its name says, yes, it's a flying laboratory. Yep. Uh, so we developed it starting back in 2008. Uh, a corporate decision was made that we needed to have this capability, both as a laboratory and also to demonstrate the power of what we call multi-intelligence, okay. or sensors that work in different uh, aspects of intelligence collection on a single platform, working together to present the customer a coherent solution. Okay. So in the course of about a year, we procured the aircraft on the used market, we removed all of the commercial business jet fittings, and we outfitted as an intelligence platform. Okay, cool. And uh, so working with this, you're, uh, are you likely to sell this capability to uh, various groups, or are you proving a point for a larger system? Um, I would say both. Yeah. You're, number one, this capability in the medium-sized business jet in our catalog of offerings uh, sits in the upper middle aspect of the, of the market. Yep. Um, the Gulfstream G550, which is off to our left here at the show, or uh, some of the other larger aircraft sit at the high end. Yep. And, and likewise, there's cargo aircraft variants that we've yep. also mounted intelligence systems to yep. at the medium end. So number one, we'd be absolutely, this is a, an, an incredibly powerful platform in and of itself. Yep. But it also allows us to do several other things. We can reduce risk on sensor arrays or processing um, systems that are mounted on here. Yep. So it's prove them out on an aircraft. Yep. And second, we can um, experiment with parts of an architecture that will mount in a larger aircraft. Yep. So in, in, in summary, it both would be an excellent platform in, its, in and of itself, yep. but it also proves out risk, uh, reduces risk, Yep. and shows the value of the platform for larger or smaller systems. Okay. And uh, what what would be a typical scenario? Like, uh, would a government own this or would it be a private organization doing analysis? Um, these days, there are several different business models that are used. The traditional one is the government owns and the government operates. Yep. Second, you will often see these days a either the government owned and a contractor crew operates. Yep. Or in some cases, in the buy-by-the-hour mode, the contractor would own and they would lease it as a service to the government these days. Okay. So around the world you'll see all three models in place. Yep. It also has great applicability to what you'd have to call civil missions. Yep. So there's a number of companies out there in the civilian market who uh, develop these systems for imaging the earth and the yep. surface and developing uh, geospatial products yep. to help with agriculture or crisis management. This kind of platform would be ideal for that also. Yep. Now you got a uh, for, uh, Fleur turret on the back there. Yes, That's we the do. Infrared system. It's, uh, yes. Yep. 
Uh, what other systems, what, what's that one used for and what other systems have you got on board? Okay, so from rear to front we have an electro-optical system that's both electro-optical and infrared by yep. Flare Systems Incorporated, their Star Sapphire 3 system, yep. a very capable turret system that allows you for a day, night, uh, and nearly all weather. Obviously some weather is, is too bad even for the <laughs> IR to get through. Yep. Uh, very capable system. We also have both electronic intercept and direction finding system, yep. uh, both for low band radios and high band radars. Yep. And directly behind us in the radome here is where we mount a medium to large synthetic aperture radar. Okay. That's an imaging radar that creates a synthetic picture of the Earth's surface yep. from the, uh, basically as the name suggests, the synthetic aperture that the yep. radar establishes as it flies through the sky. Okay. Yep. Um, and uh, that covers the gamut of the sensors that are on there right now. Okay. So it has radar, intercept gear, and also the electro-optical turret. Okay. So what would be a typical mission profile of uh, sending this bird out? Um, for an aircraft of this size, you would uh, take off and climb to orbit at somewhere between 35 and 45,000 feet. Yep. And then it would typically maintain either a long uh, racetrack type orbit yep. where it circles in a large oval in the sky. Yep. and allows you to look off to either the port or starboard size with your gear yep. to uh, monitor a situation. Yep. Or in some cases, uh, you would put a circular orbit where you've got a, a specific area you want continuous surveillance of, okay. and you would circle that area quite yep. a bit of distance. Okay. And you could also just be doing uh, like grid patterns to map the map terrain mapping and things yes. like that? Yes. Um, if you're doing, uh, you'd be a, doing a wide grid where yep. either the radar or the electro-optical would be imaging the Earth's surface uh, to build up a, a uh, a modern map. Yep. An updated map. Okay. So for perhaps some ge uh, geological an analysis. Geological and survey, for instance. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Cool. Steve. In the modern environment we're operating, and obviously electronic intelligence is is where it's at. It's obviously a very uh, competitive industry for you. Yes. You got a lot of competition that's followed you down here to Avalon, and uh, things are going well for you. Things are going very well because it's very good visits. Um, yes, it's a competitive industry, and. Uh, uh, a lot of companies put together platforms that uh, bring electronic intelligence to the customer, but we, uh, we are very satisfied with the performance of the G3 and the customers are very interested in it so far. Excellent. And, and you think, um, you know, this is quite an old airframe, uh, the gentleman was telling us earlier, uh, uh, is this the sort of thing that would be easily retrofitted onto a, an existing airframe if, if that was a requirement of the customer or are we looking at fitting it to new aircraft primarily? Um, when you work with a customer, you know, you have to understand first um, how fast they need something. So, for instance, often you can get a used aircraft very rapidly and a new aircraft would take a longer period. Or maybe they have a price point where they have an affordability target where they have to design the system to the, the cost profile. Um, most of the business jets we've looked at, especially, for instance, the Gulf Streams we see here, are extremely capable. Um, it did sound like it's an older platform, but it performs fantastically. Yeah. Um, so new or used, you have to go into a consultation with the customer to see where, you know, he or she needs to be on the on the uh, the aircraft type. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, is there anything else you'd like to put in that we haven't asked? Um, no, other than it's been fantastic to be here at Avalon. Everyone has been uh, terrific at the show, and we've really enjoyed being in Australia so far. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much for your time, mate, oh, and it's you. a great-looking bird. Great. Glad you could be here. Cool. Thanks. Thank you.